Hello and welcome to the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me as always, Corey Waldron. What's up, Corey? No much, Nick. It's a beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Didn't get any snow, so I'm extremely happy. I'm over the winter. Yeah, uh, unlike you, I did get snow and it's starting to come down a little bit harder now. So maybe eight to ten inch, eight to ten inches range, but we'll see what happens. But snow near basketball. Snow near yeah. basketball, that's all. Not bad. Good slate of games tonight. Plenty to talk about. You know, biggest news, though, this week, I think probably one of the big time players in the league. It's kind of a question mark if he's going to play much the rest of the season, if at all, or come back perfectly fine in the week. And that's Kyrie Irving. You know, he's missed four straight games. There's been talk about him getting a second opinion. They say there's no structural damage. And from what I believe, it's the same knee he had surgery on in 2015 that made him miss the NBA finals. So what are your thoughts on Kyrie and the concern with his knee? Well, first, I'm not long-term concerned. Like This is for the short term I'm concerned, but long term I'm not really worried about it. From what I've read, at least, the screws in his knees simply need to be either replaced or taken out. It's nothing like seriously wrong with his knee, um, unless they botched the screws, I guess, which then, then I'd be extremely concerned. But right now I'm not concerned. Um, all this means, though, for the Celtics is that they are, they are bound, in my opinion, for a first-round upset. Uh, to whoever they play in the first round. We'll get we'll get to the playoffs in a little bit. You mentioned you're not concerned about the future. Do you think he should just get the screws removed or get the surgery done right away and get it done with, or he should wait to the offseason? Danny Ainge mentioned it could be something he might get done in a year, two years down the line. It doesn't seem necessary at the time, but should he just get it done and be precautious about it, or what do you think? I don't know why you'd wait. Why would you? It's like driving a car. You know you have like a bad, I don't know, an alternator or a uh, a pistol caliber in your tire, whatever the hell. I'm not a car guy. But, like, are you going to continue to drive even though you know it could, like, fall off or your car could break at any moment? I, I would just get it fixed. Why would Kyrie put himself through the pain of playing with, uh, you know, bad screws in his knee when you already have Gordon Hayward out, Jalen Brown's banged up, Marcus Smart is banged up. You're not really playing for anything this season. And you're kidding yourself if you think the Celtics are playing for something this season. They're playing for the Eastern Conference appearance at best. And if they got super lucky – maybe a finals appearance, but I don't think they're better than any team in the East currently uh, with all the injuries. Well, you mentioned you think they'd get upset in the first round. You think that'd be any matchup or there's specific teams you think they'd see in the first round? I know we talked about it a little bit later, but with the injuries, you think that would knock them out or really give them a tough seven games? Every team besides the Bucks have an 85% chance of upsetting wow. the Celtics. The Bucks, I'd say they, they actually probably have the, the least – they're least favorable, in my opinion, over the Celtics. I think the Celtics have enough defense and, and gritty guys who they could actually beat the Bucs, who well, I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit, are struggling to have an identity at this point in the season. Yeah, Evan Dial just wrote a great piece on the Bucs about their identity and the lineups they need to do in the matchups that might help them. I think, you know, the Bucs are just a team right now that are looking like the worst team in the Eastern Conference playoffs. They could turn around and be a problem, but that's, you know, a lot has to happen between now and April 14th. But I agree. I think the Celtics could be in trouble in the first round. I still like them in most first-round series just because I like Brad Stevens. And I think what they've shown against OKC last night and in previous games, they can really just grind you out. And they play defense on, like, many teams in the Eastern Conference. So, yeah, Kyrie would definitely hurt. But I have I have confidence in Brad Stevens that he could probably squeeze out a first-round win. But you think no I, chance I just, at the finals? I don't think they have any chance at the finals. Not if Kyrie's not healthy. If Kyrie's not playing, there's no way to make the NBA Finals. If Kyrie's healthy, do you think they can still get to the Finals? When you have a talent like Kyrie Irving, yes, there's still a chance. But even still, uh, I'm not putting them over the um, the Raptors at this point. The Raptors have been too good. And they're too collectively good on defense as well, just like the Celtics are. So I, I wouldn't be able to give the Celtics an advantage in that series. Would you put a healthy Boston Celtics team over the Cavs? You know, healthy Kyrie, healthy Marcus oh, Smart, sure. healthy Jalen Brown. Oh, for sure. If the Celtics are healthy, if the Celtics are healthy, they're in the Eastern Conference Finals playing the Raptors, and that series is going six, seven games. And I'm not positive who wins, but this team just isn't healthy. Yeah. So most of your, you know, reasoning for not backing the Celtics is mostly health. Oh, one hundred percent. It's yeah. I mean, I'm just going off what I see on paper, and when I look at an injury report, and all these guys are banged up. Who knows when Marcus Smart will be back? Who knows with Kyrie Irving? And honestly, Jalen Brown, that fall was really nasty. And you know, Al Horford has missed like two months of a season before with a concussion. Miles Turner for the Pacers missed like a month and a half because of a concussion. So 
who knows how long Jalen Brown's going to be out for. And that type of injury can sometimes make you a little bit nervous about doing that same type of play. You know, Jalen Brown's going to think about it. Next time he goes up, they go for a play like that, that somebody might do that again, and he might end up on his head, which is a terrible thing to think about, but it's still a possibility. What are your thoughts if Gordon Hayward was healthy this season? What do you think we think of the Celtics? Would they be a one seed? Would they be, you know, looking like a real shot at the finals and a chance at maybe beating one of the teams in the West? They're still not at that level yet, even with Gordon Hayward. I think we'd be talking about um, a Raptors, Celtics, Eastern Conference Finals going seven games, where I think pretty much, you know, all of us in the NBA Twitter and basketball world would just think, it would be completely split down the middle. I think those two teams would be very even if Gordon Hayward was healthy at this point in the season. Um, I'm still not rooting on uh, any of these Asia Conference teams over the teams in the West, but uh, they would have a certainly a good chance of making the finals. Well, talking about the finals, who would be your real contenders this season? You know, teams that actually have a shot to go to the finals. And – I want to say, I guess, necessarily win, but actually getting to the finals, I think, makes you a contender alone. So who has the best shot? You know, who's your real contenders right now in the NBA? All right. So I, I, have, I have four teams down. So the first two, obviously, are the Rockets and the Warriors. Uh, that goes without saying. Those are my... No real, way. No way. <laughs> yeah, right. That's real out of left field picks there. And then the Raptors for me on the East. And the Cavs, obviously, I have five teams. The Cavs, obviously are going to be there because with LeBron James, I'm not going to put them out of the picture, but they definitely have the lowest chance of making the NBA Finals, I think, uh, compared to, like, seasons past. And I think a dark horse, at least in the East, is the Pacers. And that's my own little bias. But because the East, in my opinion, is so wide open and because the Pacers play really good defense, they do ball movement, uh, the Pacers, to me, have a chance to win any seven-game series in the Eastern Conference. They're certainly not the best team in the Eastern Conference. They would have to beat the Raptors. I don't even think they're better than the um, the Cavs or the Celtics. But I'm saying they have a good chance at this point in time because they're not they're the least banged up too to a degree. They're missing some bonus, but he'll be back within the next week, and they're starting to play good. Yeah, I mean, I could see the Pacers against most teams in the East. I just I couldn't see them beating probably the Raptors. You know, Boston's banged up. They'd have a shot. The Cavs, I don't think LeBron loses them, but they could definitely avoid them and get themselves maybe Eastern Conference Finals appearance. Uh, the other teams I agree with, obviously, Golden State, Houston. Uh, Toronto is a team that I really like as well. And like you said, the Cavs, any team that has LeBron James, is as bad as they are, he has the ability to just kind of make players a lot better than they are. So they could just end up there. And who knows? Injuries can happen. Do you think there's any shot in the West of if somebody, you know, coming up and ending up in the Western Conference Finals not being Golden State or Houston, especially when you consider Golden State's injury? I know that they're getting a little bit healthy. But do you think another team could squeeze into the Western Conference Finals? There's only one team that comes to mind, honestly, and it's the OKC, it's the OKC Thunder. Um, with Westbrook, Paul George, Adams, and Melo, if if those guys are firing all cylinders, we've seen how good they are when everyone is hitting shots. Their biggest issue is what happens when, you know, Paul George is ice cold and Melo is ice cold. You know, they have to have at least two of those superstars, you know, going. Corey Brewer has been a fantastic addition for them. The bench for them obviously is shaky. But if they were to catch fire, you know, that team is, still has a lot of star power, which makes them, you know, in a seven-game series, they have the possibility of advancing deep in the playoffs. What are your thoughts on a team like Portland? You know, still not there yet, just, you know, kind of having good luck in the Western Conference, the teams getting hurt. Or, you know, they just need one more player to compete with a guy, you know, a OKC or a Golden State or a Houston. I, I think with last night, I know, I'm sure you watched most of the game or some of the game. You know, they kept up with them. And that was on a night where Lillard was ice cold for the most part. McCollum wasn't there. And they stuck with the Rockets. And James Harden was fantastic. What, he finished with 42 or 44? Yep. I know he had over 40. Uh, he was great. And I think, yeah, I definitely think they're missing a piece. The only reason I don't have them going deep in the playoffs is I just – it, it's hard for me to think that Lillard and McCollum can lead, you know, those those that team to seven, you know, four wins in a seven game series over at least the Rockets or the Warriors because they have to go through at least one of them. Yeah, I mean, they definitely would need some role players to get hot. Aminu had like a crazy game yesterday, a crazy first quarter at least. 
So, I mean, I think that's what it is. That third component, you know, from that maybe three, four, or five position, somebody would need to step up for four games. I just like the depth of Golden State and Houston way more than most of the teams in the West. I'll give you a dark horse, and I know this is a team that you mentioned. I think, like, some of it would be momentum, and I don't think they'd be a favorite or anything, but they could just really grind out a series, and that's the Utah Jazz. Like, when you win that many games, like, you just have some irrational confidence, and I think that's something that could help them come playoff time. I know they just lost to the Hawks, but, you know, it doesn't really – they kind of just probably fell asleep for the game. I I want you to know that I had the Jazz down last – yesterday. And then this morning I was watching my highlights, and I watched the Hawks Jazz highlights. And I was like, man, I don't know if I can go on the record the next day (laughs) saying the Jazz are a dark horse and they lose to the team I hate the most. But uh, I definitely agree, Nick. Because of defense wins championships, their defense is elite. You know, if those guys are firing all cylinders, they're playing good defense. I mean, Joe English just missed the game tying three to end that game. He was just short. Uh, but I, I, I agree. They're, they're definitely a dark horse. And people sleep on them, and they're very well coached at Quinn Snyder. So I, I like that hey, pick. Rudy Gobert is kind of slept on in a way. Like, I know so, it's either like people, it's kind of like similar to the Jokic thing, where people are either like really on Rudy Gobert and, you know, believe in the impact he brings. So they're like, oh, he's just a defensive center. He doesn't really do anything. Like, I think his impact defensively could really cause some problems. It's just like the other guys, perimeter-wise, It would be really interesting to see what they would do. You know, I saw, Gobert's like uh, – I know I mentioned this. I Sorry to cut you off, Corey. On okay. a previous pod, he was like leading defensive metrics for the season, and he hasn't even played the whole season. Yeah. What I was going to say, piggybacking off that, is I saw a poll on Twitter, and it was like, who would you rather have, Prime Dwight Howard or Rudy Gobert? Who are you taking? Oh, that's a really good poll, and I think – at this point in his career, I think we would be underselling Dwight. And, you know, I'm not a huge Dwight guy, but at one point in Orlando, he really got them to a finals without any other all-stars. You know, he was an offensive guy and a defensive guy, even though it was the basic post-up, bang him down, get the easy layup or dunk on somebody. It's something Gobert hasn't done enough consistently. Defensively, though, I think Gobert could bring a bigger impact because of his ability to move a little bit better, and that length is just crazy. You know, Dwight's great, and it was a lot of athleticism and jumping ability and size and strength, but Gobert just has that standing reach that is ridiculous where he can almost block shots standing up or on his tippy toes. Yeah, I, I, I think for me personally, overall, I think I would have went with Dw- prime Dwight, but if we're going just by defense, I think Rudy Gobert is still better because, I mean, like you mentioned, the length and the rim protection he brings. I mean, obviously Dwight had a couple of years where he averaged over three blocks per game. But even still, he, he doesn't do the, the kind of things that Rudy Gobert does, which, like, truly alters shots. Yeah, we could see Gobert if he, you know, Quinn Snyder, like you mentioned, is a great coach, kind of help him work on his offensive game. Definitely a nice combo going forward with Donovan Mitchell and uh, Rudy Gobert. But moving to the East, is there any dark horse other than the Pacers that you think in the East? You know, like, I think um, Washington would be a super interesting team if John Wall was to come back at 100%, which would be highly unlikely considering he's coming off injury. We didn't see him at 100% this season. But for some reason, a Washington team, like, fully juiced up with a John Wall and Bradley Beal onto this, like, new role, I think it could really, you know, excite some teams in the playoffs. I I do. It's it's tough. I mean, like, if Philly... If Philly wasn't so inexperienced, I would want to pick them. But I just don't know how, like, guys like Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid will react their first time in the playoffs. But, I, I mean, for me, that's probably the only other team I would put some stake into because they have a lot of guys who can beat you. You know, they got a lot of guys who space the floor. I mean, Joel Embiid, we talked about this on the last pod. Depending on how he handles the minute increase in a seven-game series will be interesting to see. But, I mean – He's been dominant this year. There hasn't been a lot of games where we've seen him truly struggle in the, in the game. Yeah, and even if he does, you know, Ben Simmons has a triple-double. Like, and if Embiid also is struggling offensively, not hitting his shot, he's usually doing a good job on the boards or just kind of just being a big body and kind of intimidating players. So I think that would be a good team to keep an eye on. But like you said, I think, you know, the youth, the inexperience, and some of the role players, they're not terrible, but they're not, you know, the greatest. You know, something- I know they a- added Bellinelli and Arisova, but still. And something the Sixers, to their credit, too, I remember seeing this uh, last week, they have the best rebounding percentage in the NBA. That's not so, a bad stat at all. I'll no, tell you I, a, a bad stat, though, about the Sixers. I believe they're one of the worst fourth-quarter scoring teams in the NBA. So they kind of get gradually worse as the game progresses sometimes, and I think that's kind of an inexperience, you know, type of thing you see from a young team. Oh, for sure. That's, I completely agree. That's, that's literally a team that doesn't know how to win yet, 
That's, yeah, that's, exactly. what I always, that's what I always think when I see a young team struggling in the fourth quarter is they just don't know how to win yet. Yeah, and Philly probably is already going to be scary next season. <laughs> like one off season, like, yeah, they did also draft this guy, Markel Fultz, who was supposed to be really good. You know, don't worry about him, though. He could be back next season, give him some scoring punch that they really need from the guard spot. It'd be wild. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think about. So, you know, and, they're st- and, they're st- and they still have money to go out and sign, you know, a max free agent. Not that they're going to get LeBron, but they still have money to add a superstar if they wanted to or if they can. Yeah, it'd be intriguing if they try to really make a push for Paul George, but that's for another podcast. Let's talk Bucks, though. You mentioned you kind of hinted at it before. This is a team that's really struggled. They fired Jason Kidd. You know, they brought on interim head coach. They won some more games, and they ended up going on a losing streak again. Reports came out this week that they were very, very close to trading Jabari Parker at the trade deadline, and there's slim to no chance of him returning with the team this offseason. What are your thoughts on that and the Jabari situation in Milwaukee? Uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, I watched, I watched that team and like, he looks, he doesn't look connected with the guys on the floor. Like it, do, like, it doesn't look like he's obviously built into the culture or, like that he wants to be there anyways. Obviously there was some, uh, something came out recently that he wasn't happy with his role and everything else. So who knows? We've seen this kind of stuff happen before and organizations and a player have like mended their relationship. But like you mentioned, I, I think he's likely gone. Uh, depending on what the market is, because he hasn't been blowing, you know, he hasn't been fantastic since he came back from injury. So I'm not sure he's going to get like the max deal he may be expecting, or a team like the Nets may just offer it, and then someone will have to match it. Uh, but I, I, it's it's weird because I think Jabari Parker is extremely talented, and if I was the Bucks, I would not want to let him go. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird situation. They probably had a idea in their head already when they made the trade for Eric Bledsoe money-wise. They really want to cap-strap themselves with a Jabari Parker type of move. Maybe an Atlanta type of team would be interested in them. I'm not sure if the Nets would be interested. Maybe, you know, it's just a talented guy. I think Jabari's position is still a little bit unknown. I know some people have, you know, favored him at the three, some favored him at the four. Kind of really see where he works in the NBA. Three-point shot consistency, something to worry about too. It's also said that Jason Kidd was a main reason that this relationship between Jabari and the Bucks got kind of messed up. So, well, it was it was also known that Jason Kidd like wanted to trade him badly. So I, yeah. I'm sure that had an impact on it. Yeah, that's never a good thing, and especially you know, Kidd's been known to really want to trade a lot of players, even if they're not necessarily doing a bad job. I don't know. There, but, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of places I could see Jabari going. I don't know if you wrote down any teams, but like I put down a couple of teams I could see him going to. Where do you think? Well, I think the Sixers would be a possibility if they miss out on LeBron. If they wanted to add another guy who can, who's young and can run. I think Jabari Parker kind of makes sense. And then uh, kind of a, a shot in the dark with the Knicks. I think the Knicks are kind of oh, like looking to make a splash. That's an interesting it's, one. I'm not sure about their cap. There's a, there's a rumor that they're going to stretch Noah. Yeah. Well, that could open up some money. I think, but you're right. I think somebody could offer Jabari a solid trade because, I mean, he is a former top top three pick. What was he? Number two. And he's a guy that can really bring some talent to your team and some hype because there is, you know, some excitement when he plays. He's still throwing down some monster dunks from coming off, you know, the ACL injury. So, I mean, it's a risk, but some team definitely will take it this summer. And, hey, if the Pacers want to go after Aaron Gordon, they should probably look at Jabari Parker too because there's really not much of a difference at this point in their careers, in my opinion, besides the fact that Parker has been hurt. Uh, But I I would personally, if the Pacers wanted to go as one of those guys, I'd be looking at Parker and over Aaron Gordon. That, uh, actually, um, Jacob Hershon brought, brought up that poll once on Twitter, and it is a good conversation. I think you look at Jabari as a guy that has a higher ceiling, you know, more offensively talented. You look at an Aaron Gordon guy, you kind of have a better idea of what you're already getting. There's still definitely room for improvement. Like we've seen plenty of Orlando Magic players leave and do a great job, and you know that firsthand with Victor Oladipo. So I wouldn't be completely surprised if Aaron Gordon left and we saw him add more to his game. And I think he's a little bit safer health-wise. But then you look at Jabari, and he definitely has that offensive pop to his game and a little bit more, I, I guess I would say, basketball IQ to his game than Aaron Gordon. Yeah, and, and Gordon, like, to me, it just I don't know. He seems like one of those guys, in my opinion. He's just like a dunk. And obviously the jump shot's coming around. He reminds me of like a less talented Blake Griffin at this point. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely, like I said, I, I have a hard time gauging him in Orlando. I think we all have a hard time gauging a lot of players in Orlando. It's hard to say if he's, you know, putting up some of the numbers because the team's so bad or they don't have very talented players or it's just like he's playing with a whole bunch of bad players and he's doing the best he possibly can. I think that's a guy – those two guys are going to be two players that you really keep an eye on in the offseason, see the type of money they get, especially with, I think, 
what I've seen on Twitter, just based off of right now, without making any cuts, stretches, or things like that, I think there's only about seven teams with cap space this offseason. That's wild. So, I'm guessing yeah. the Phoenix Suns are one of them, right? Most likely. I, I mean, I last time I checked, it was a lot of the lower-level teams. So keep an eye on that. And it also could mean a lot of salary dumps for teams, you know, trading a player, giving them a first-round pick, things along those lines. Well, before we get out of here, we got to talk James Harden. You mentioned him before. Against the Blazers, he just hit some ridiculous step-back shots. Like, they, they were, he was at one point getting double-team, fading it back, hitting a three late in the fourth quarter. So without – I mean, this is a stupid question, but he's a 100% lock MVP, correct? You saw my tweet last night, Nick, didn't you? Uh, I probably – yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> you know exactly. There, Curry did something no one else has done a couple of years ago. James Harden's going to be the second person in NBA history to do it. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. I mean, I could see him being unanimous MVP. He also, I mean, I thought he should have won MVP last year, but that's for a whole nother discussion. I know people were obsessed with the triple double, but if you're really giving Westbrook the trip, the MVP because of one rebound, it's like, eh, because James Harden made his teammates so much better, and people would be like, oh, well, the Rockets were more talented. But Co-MVPs. Still, I believe, yeah. I, I'll say to this day, last year should have had co-MVPs. We've seen it, we've seen it before in the NFL. It's happened in baseball. It's it's rare, but last year to me there should have been co MVPs because both those guys had fantastic seasons. You yeah, can really I, make an, you can make an argument for both guys. That's how great they were. They both had phenomenal off the charts uh, kind of years. Yeah, and nobody was really mad when Westbrook won, but still it would have been nice to see you know Harding get his recognition, especially after losing it to Steph a few years ago. But his coach D'Antoni said that he was the James Harden was the best offensive player he's ever seen. You think D'Antoni is hyping him up, or he really thinks that he's the best offensive player he's ever seen in his life? Well, one, you're never going to say my guy's second or third. Uh, you're always going to say he's the best. So well, D'Antoni, I mean, you could you could word it like you know Harden's one of the all time great offensive players, but right? Right. That he is the best. Right. Um, I, it's probably a combination of both. I'm sure he does believe it, though. Like it is the politically correct answer, or like you know for that team. But I think he I think he means it. I don't know if he is the the offense the best ever, but I mean I know a lot of people were comparing him to Kobe last night on Twitter, and he's better than Kobe offensively. I I don't care. Kobe's my favorite player of all time. Kobe's fantastic, and Kobe was relentless and a killer. But I mean James Harden does a lot of things that you know Kobe wasn't doing as a whole in his entire career. Yeah, I mean Harden just does a lot of things in an elite level that we've never really seen a ton of players do. You know what I mean? He's got the elite passing vision, the passing touch, the basketball IQ, the handles, the ability to drive to the rim, the strength, finishing through combat, con combat, contact, the step back three. It's just like he does so much. It's rare that you see such a great offensive score with such a nice passing game. You know, you said it. You said it just now, like while you were naming th- characteristics of Harden. His IQ, I feel like, goes underrated. I don't think people give him enough credit for how smart he is. I don't know. Last night, there were several times in that fourth quarter where he he set up a he want he called for a pick because he wanted Lillard to guard him. Like it just like certain things that he does. Like even though he ISOs a lot, he ISOs on players that he knows he can beat often. Like the Wesley Johnson, like Wesley Johnson on against the Clippers and stuff. Like he picks matchups that he knows he can dominate, and then moving the ball around, finding Capella all the time, finding Ariza late in that game for a three. You know, he's just – he's always looking. I know LeBron gets, you know, the – he always gets the praise for being so smart. James Harden is pretty damn smart. Yeah, and I think, you know, everybody hates him so much about the damn fouls, which kind of gets annoying after a while. But it's part of the basketball IQ thing. Drawing fouls is a skill. You know what I mean? It's helping your team, especially when you're getting in the bonus earlier in the quarter. The other team can't play quite as tight, especially with James. And you saw how the – I mean, the Spurs did a great job, and they're probably one of the few teams that's done an amazing job defending him. But what they did, they kind of had to change their whole defensive stance when they played the Rockets. You know, the players had to keep their hands high where the refs could see them so they couldn't get them intertwined and get the foul calls. It's kind of like you said, just off that basketball IQ. And, I mean – it's really like in the NBA right now, would you say that he might be the most gifted offensive player in terms of scoring and passing combination? Probably. Yeah. I mean, he, for sure. I mean, yes, 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 he is. Because, uh, like, I mean, you think LeBron and obviously he's not the scorer that, you know, Harden is, but he is definitely the passer and the ability to get to the rim. But the one thing that, LeBron doesn't have that Harden has is that step back. Obviously, I'm definitely not saying James Harden is better than LeBron James, but offensively, I think he has a more 
more to his game in a sense where LeBron obviously is the elite player overall. I, I agree. I mean, just look at what he does all around. I mean, and even his defense is picked up. Yeah, especially on ball. James Harden right now, like I'm just thinking here, he's top three in this league, and he might be the second best player in this league. It, for this season, I think you could definitely make the argument that he's, you know, top top two, top three player in the league. You know, overall, I mean, it's a tough argument to make with yeah, Steph yeah, and KD. I, I, I'm not saying – I'm saying like this year. He's, yeah. he's by far – he's probably actually the best player this year. If you win MVP – you're probably the best player in the season. And LeBron's had an amazing season, but he's definitely taking games off. And, like, we hate on Harden so much for taking defensive plays off, which he hasn't done as much this year. LeBron's a culprit of that just as much as anybody. You know, we've seen him just stand there on defense and kind of let the guy go by and then put up a 30-point triple-double. So I think it would be – I think it's definitely an argument to be made that Harden could be the best player in the NBA this season, especially just with the consistency of the huge numbers. The fact Chris Paul was out for so long and them having the best record in the NBA – you know, it's just a lot of different things working. I don't even know if I've ever thought James Harden would reach this level. Like, I thought that he was, you know, top 10, top 5 player, but I never thought that he would be one of the guys, you know, we'd be talking about having the best player in the NBA this season. You could argue that maybe he was the best player in the NBA last season too. Yeah, no, I I agree. I have actually been one of the people who have slept on James Harden. Um, his defense and the flopping, I think, really clouded my judgment early. Because as I mentioned to you before, off the pod and on the pod, I don't watch an overly abundance of West Coast games. I just don't stay up that late generally to watch you know, the Houston Rockets play the the Grizzlies or the Suns or whatever. So like I haven't seen a ton of James Harden over the past several years. But watching him this year in particular, when I have watched him, you know the the flopping and the defense that I saw sporadically in the past, I don't see as often. Like yeah, he still flops a little bit. He still gets those ticky tacky fouls by driving. But he is nowhere – he is 10 times better than he was two years ago and he sort of won MVP arguably that year. Yeah, definitely. It's just another level to his game and the efficiency he does it at. And I think one under uh, – you know, a tribute that's kind of underrated for Harden is his strength. You saw him a few times last night. Dame Miller tried to get physical with him and bump him around a little bit. And all he did is hit Dame with a little bump and then next, next dribble move he was net into the rim. So I think that's one thing kind of underestimated from is like he has some pretty good size on him that people kind of sleep on. I honestly saw a photo of him this offseason working out. Um, it was a picture of him with like, you know, just a tank top on. And I think I saw one with Jimmy Butler too. And those guys were yoked in like mid-July because they were yeah. probably putting on size and they cut down for the season. So he made it look as big. But there was a point in time where him and Jimmy Butler both were yoked. And I'm saying like James Harden had veins popping out of veins on his biceps. Yeah, I mean, and it's also like just watching it on TV, you kind of forget how big these guys are. When you see them in person live, you know, eye to eye, like it's definitely a different level. And that's a guy that probably you see him live would be incredible. James Harden, I personally never seen live and I'd like to. But uh, that wraps it up for today. Corey, as always, thank you for hopping on. You can always listen to the NBA outlet on iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com. And as I mentioned, now airing on Dash Radio. Thank you, as always, for listening. Peace.